learning something new every day. I hope everyone had a great weekend. That was like the perfect, most beautiful weekend we could have asked for. You deserved it after last week. And let's see, we're gonna start with a video this morning. Um, this one is of a fourth grade teacher and there's a reason that I picked it. So I thought I would share it with you. And did I do, hang on, I'm gonna double check before I hit play. So I'm gonna stop my share. And then I'm gonna share again because I don't know if I had the sound turned on. I did not, see? Feels like a Monday right now. There we go. Okay. And play. The COVID-19 pandemic is having a big impact on kids. With schools shut down, their sense of normalcy has been derailed. Remote learning has become the new norm. And while that definitely has its challenges, educators throughout Maine are finding creative ways to engage with their students. News at Maine, Shannon Moss introduces to us to one of those teachers really making a difference. New pair of pajamas. Jen Merrifield teaches fourth no, grade at Falmouth there. Elementary School. This is her 29th year of teaching, and due to COVID-19, one of the most challenging. The hardest part is making sure that we're connecting with our kids. You know, that's why we went into teaching was to be with our students and have that one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one -face connection. Her students, now learning from home, miss their teacher. She made us like learning. She made us motivated in the morning. She always like, she has something like up her sleeve for us to do. <laughs> or, like something like funny. Good morning team Merrifield. So Mrs. Merrifield decided in addition to her lesson plans, she would create videos that not only deliver important messages. It's not the same without you here with me. But showcase the charismatic personality her students have come to know and love. We've been told to stay home and it looks like it's working. This is how I wake up in the morning. I'm like always excited to see them because they always like make my day. They're really like funny. I really <laughs> like them. They are amazing. Very entertaining. Yes. What else do you have for the Merrifield team? Parents who have now become teachers helpers appreciate all the effort. For today. And I think it immediately engages them in and gets them excited for what she's going to be teaching in, in that day. Team, this is Captain Merrifield reporting for duty. Anything we can do to lessen the anxiety of our students and support our parents, that's again why we do this. It was only 20 homes where these messages of I miss you and you rock were found. Shannon Moss, we New Center, Maine. We were able to make phone contact because and Mrs. Merrifield says now that remote learning is going to continue for the remainder of this school year, she's going to have to up her game and come up with a lot of new ideas for her videos. All right. So I'm not expecting any of you to sing. Well, of course, unless you want to or, or you know, you're moved to do so. I love that piece because it talks pretty much how you kind of have to turn up the volume on who you are. And we have no problem being silly or being ourselves in front of our students in a classroom where there's really nobody else except for the teacher and the class that has built that culture. So to build it online or to build it in a combination of having students in the building and students at home and switching around is going to be a challenge. And you might have to like I said, turn up the volume on who you are so that that comes shining through because that's going to make all the difference for your students. YouTube is a great way to be able to do that. And whether or not you feel comfortable videoing yourself, I certainly don't expect you to put yourself on your front lawn like a news reporter, but you'll find what it is that works for you and what turns up your volume so that your students can hear you loud and clear. But YouTube is a great place to be able to house that and also to be able to share other videos or other resources that you find to be useful for your students. So what we're going to do first is I'm going to head to YouTube, which I never do in front of students. <laughs> um, let me hit escape here to get out of my full screen. I there's, oh, and I'm going to add something to my list that I didn't even think of that I want to make sure that I share. I've shared it with many of you, but in case I have missed anyone, I'll make sure. Um, I never, just like you never Google in front of the kids, you never YouTube in front of the kids. Um, it's the, <laughs> what ends up happening when I go here to YouTube is that I, as an adult, am looking for what I am intending to show. My students 
are already looking at, hey, what did she already watch? Where did she go next? So when I start to look for, say, kid president, who is always, if I ever do an example to show anything on YouTube, I always use kid president. Very safe. Look at all the results. Very safe. So he's my favorite. And even though the, his videos have been around for quite some time, um, they're still very much worth sharing. But what will happen is as soon as I open a video, number 20, thank you. And hit pause. Again, my students are not necessarily looking here while I'm getting ready to make that full screen. They're looking over here at the next suggested videos. They might be looking down here at the comments. They're looking at everything else and they take it in a lot faster than we do. So my advice is never to YouTube in front of the kids. Find those videos that you want to be able to share ahead of time. Or if you're like, oh man, I forgot to preload that. I want to be able to show the kids, then certainly do it in another screen without the students being able to see it. So one thing that I want to be able to show, and it's not coming up right now. I don't know if it comes up on every video or not. Some of them might already be classified as okay. But what you'll notice on some videos is somewhere in here, it will say not approved for Mashpee schools, or it will say approved for Mashpee, bleh, Mashpee schools. And maybe because I chose a kid president video, like his are already okay in general. But if there was one that was a little bit iffy, like I know I was um, looking up funny teacher videos for some of these video breaks and so let's say the Holderness family who are very- popular. Hey, how you doing? There we go. So the Holderness family is not really for all students because they're funny and not always appropriate. So here it is. So it says video not approved for MPS PK 12 and I could approve it. This isn't for teachers. Like I'm not approving it for teachers. I'm approving it for the kid accounts in our district and it's for all of them. It's for K to 12. So if you have a video that you want to show your students, make sure ahead of time that you've hit approve if it has an approve button. They're not all going to have this approve button if they're not appropriate. It, or the ones that have approved buttons are not necessarily inappropriate. Let me put it that way. But you want to make sure that you've hit that. Otherwise, your students won't be able to see it. And that's something relatively new. It came about at the same time that YouTube came out with their for kids, not for kids. You probably received a few emails from YouTube saying that you had to categorize your videos for kids, not for kids. It was around the same time that the approved came out. So only one person. That, um, yeah. Does does that take off the side video type things? If you actually approve it for Mashpee Public Schools, does it take all those videos off the side? It does not. I do have the settings right now for students. I'd have to test it again because it's been a while. Sometimes those settings we do like set it and forget it. I believe that right now we have the settings shut off so that you can't see the comments. And it might be that we have the like, um, Re not requested, recommended videos might not be there, but I'm going to give you another option either way that you can use. Good question. So are those, um, if it says video not approved for MPSBK like this one does, Yep. Is the, are there some that are either channels or people or site, YouTube sites or whatever you want to call them that are 100% good, like they're mm -hmm. approved or just, the, or just the opposite, like I wouldn't trust their system. There's like millions and millions of videos on here. So the only system I would trust is me watching a video all the way through before I decide if I'm going to share it with my students. It's just, I would not trust their saying that this is a video that's not approved and then have it be perfectly fine for kids or vice versa. Like the kid president didn't have one. So I could assume that it's okay for kids, but I would still want to watch it. There might be one word in there or one phrase in there that's something that I just wouldn't feel comfortable showing, no matter what video it is. So it's just this, a guideline. This might be coming up in your tutorial here, but is there a way to um, put them in folders, different folders for different curriculum yep. units? Okay. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. Look at you ready. All right, so let me just show you what you can do in order to show a video um, that won't have all of this stuff around it. And let's get away from the Holderness family, who they are pretty funny. 
and say, yeah, um, this is why you don't Google in front of YouTube in front of your kids because I've spent so much time looking for funny teacher videos that yeah, let's go back to kid president, shall we? We shall. So here we are, kid president. Thank you. You're welcome. I am going to, instead of playing this video in YouTube for my students, I'm going to use the tool ViewPure. And this is what I was saying earlier. I've shared this with a lot of people. So first, I'm going to copy the link up here, Control C. And then I'm going to go and open up a new tab. And I'm going to go to ViewPure.com. ViewPure.com. Free site. You don't need a login. You don't need a subscription. You don't need anything. It's a free site. And then what you do is you vomit, control V, you paste your link into this box here and you hit purify. So then what it will do is it will open up your video in a brand new window. It has no suggested videos. It has no comments. It has no likes, no thumbs up, no nothing, which is awesome. I can also come down here if I want to be able to give it a custom URL, I can. If I want to change the start time or the end time, let's say the video is just too long and it loses its effectiveness. I got to write down a note length. I want to make sure I remember to say that. Um, it might lose its effectiveness if it's too long, so you could put in a start and end time. So it's really just showing the core message that you want displayed. And then what's really cool, well, you can do a few things. You can add to playlists or embed the video or generate a QR code. But at its simplest form, which I've used for years, is now I can grab this link up here and that link, I can copy it and put it into Classroom or put it into a Google slide or put it into whatever it is that I want to be able to show. And so it will then show this actual screen instead of a screen that has all of the suggested stuff on it. I'll stop for a second because usually people have questions like if I go in here now and I vomit, it will open it up. See a normal screen. So you can share that with students. Questions about view pure. I haven't put that in the notes yet, but I will. Notes. Susie. Yes. There's um there I uh, just a comment to that. There's several other um Ooh. options for that. There's one called Watchkin. The um Free Tech for Teachers blog guy just did an article about tools for displaying YouTube. Yep. Nice. So I'm trying I'm trying to get that link on our docs. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. Susie, do you have to sign in to view pure and create an account to use it? You do not. No, I've never had one. I'm seeing that they offer memberships and district plans. I don't even know what they include because I've never needed to go that deep into it. I've used it just in its most simplistic manner, but you're welcome to forge on and discover what those things are. But no, you don't have to. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So now let me go back to my YouTube over here. Um, often when I'm looking for like I told you, I was trying to find funny um, teacher videos. Sometimes I'm not looking for funny ones. You can see teacher Google site funny because I was teaching Google sites today. So let's say that's my search. And immediately I'm given like a 25 minute video, a four minute video, a one minute video, like 10 minutes. For me, I don't have time to show you a 25 minute video. So I always go up to the filter here. And I always, always, always choose for duration shorter than four minutes. So now it's going to give me results that are going to be quicker. It makes my search a lot easier when I'm trying to find something, which if I remember right, I never found anything through this, um, through this particular search. But you can also go in to find things that are more recent. I was doing that a lot when I was trying to find like back to school stuff for 2020 because back to school in 2020 is totally different or this year, which is going to include more resources that have to do with remote or hybrid or blended learning. You can also look for an entire channel on your search topic or a playlist that someone's put together that includes your topic. So there's a lot of different search tools in here that allow you to narrow down what you're looking for. But this short under four minute um, filter to me is worth gold because it's very rare that you're going to find a video that's longer than that that is worth watching. Like 
you'd have to be really interested in the topic and the person doing the presenting would have to be really awesome. I try to keep mine shorter than four minutes and it's not easy. You have to be so concise in your message um, and in your planning and your script and your images and um, what you're going to say and how many ums you say because that takes up time. But when you're when you're creating videos, you also want to think about these filters like is it too long? Could I have said it more concisely, especially kids. Just like if something's too long, they don't want to read it. If it's too long, they don't want to watch it either. All right, keep going back to my notes to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, so let's do playlists next. So a playlist is basically like a list of bookmarks or other YouTube videos that you want to keep organized. And you can either keep them private to yourself or you can share them with others, or you can even collaborate on them. So if I were to go over to, these are all my playlists over here. Like I've put all of the ones that we've been doing on these Zooms into a Mashpee 2020 playlist. So if I click on it, it's now gonna show all of those videos in a row that I've put in there. If I wanted to add another one, all I have to do, there's two ways I can do it. When I'm uploading it, I can add it to a playlist. But let's say I find an amazing video um, that teaches you how to, using View Pure, perhaps there'll be an amazing one. So this one is amazing, I can tell. So if I open that video, I have to keep it pause. Um, down here, there's this little plus thing with the three little lines that allows you to choose a playlist. So when I click that, I can put it into a playlist that I've already created or more than one that I've already created. I could put them in every list if I wanted to. So if I had different classes or different topics and I knew it would match more than one. But also if I'm like, oh geez, I still need a playlist for that amazing idea, I could create a new playlist and then I could name it new awesome playlist and then I could put that in there. Your privacy is down here. So for your playlist, you can decide if it's going to be public, meaning that everybody who goes to your YouTube account can see your playlists and what's on it. Or you can set it to unlisted. So only people that you send the link to can view it. So you share it with just your students, only your students will have that link or you can keep it completely private. Like if you're trying to, I have my watch later, it's completely private. So as I'm going through videos and I find some that are useful, I'm constantly just hitting watch later. And then once in a while, I kind of go shopping back in that list to see what on earth I put in there. And then I can move them to other playlists or I can remove them all together. So let's say I do an unlisted playlist for my new awesome playlist and I do create. So then I should be able to go back to my home page. And then I should be able to see it over here. Am I looking right at it? There it is, my new awesome playlist. And then when I open it, it comes up in here. And if I remember right, I could put in a description on it. Again, this is the unlisted part. I could change it back to public or to private if I wanted to. This is that share -o, that arrow that shares. So you could click this and then you could put your link into Google Classroom or onto social, wherever you want to put it. Also, the three little dots who allows you to collaborate with somebody else. So if I wanted to add somebody else, if I'm co-teaching or if we're working on a grade level project and we're putting together videos, it's a way to do that. You can add all of them to another list if you want to. And the last one down here are the settings, whether or not you're gonna allow it to be embedded, like if you have a website that allows for that or add new videos. Do you want them to go to the top or to the bottom or where do you want your new videos to go? So that's another thing. And then advanced settings, we go deeper in the rabbit hole. It has now brought me to basically the YouTube studio, which I'm gonna wait to show you that, but um, you can again change your privacy. You can order them. 
manually you can shift them around or you know when you put them in how many views they've had or when it was created um, all kinds of fun stuff you can do in there auto add i don't think we i don't think i'd want to go with auto add and then collaboration whether or not collaborators can add videos to this playlist so if you work with somebody else and you want them to be able to add videos to a playlist then you could turn that on questions about playlists that was fast but remember you can rewind me later there's nothing in chat right now so all right i was counting backwards from 10. my wait time is awful okay Susie, yes. I have a question here. Oh, sure. Um, when you go to your, uh, you're, you're finding a link on uh, YouTube or wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then you, you said you go to View Pure. I, I missed this part. How do you get your movie from um, YouTube to View Pure? So let's say this is the video and let me go to it. Um, there we go. Let's say this is the awesome video. You come up here and you copy the link, Control C, and then you go to View Pure, and on their home page, you just paste it right in and purify it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And the link, the new link is up here. That's the link you can put into your classroom or what have you. All right. So now, uploading a video to YouTube either there's so many different ways to make videos so i'm not teaching you how to make videos i'm teaching you how to put your video up into youtube because there's a lot of choices when you get up there um, but if you're creating them in screencastify like our next class we'll talk about screencastify and then you want to put them up to youtube then this is the process that you would go through so i am going to go to this camera here with the plus on it if you've never done it before, and I'm going to select um, upload video, I could go live, but I'm not going to um, upload video. Where are you? I don't see where you are, where your All cursor right. was. All right, let me go back to the home page on YouTube, just so that we're starting from scratch. YouTube.com. Okay, I'm up here in the right hand corner up where my face is and then the little notifications, then the waffle, and then create. So that's the little camera with the plus on it. It might be behind something on your screen if you have like pictures of us up or- It was, that's that exactly what yep. it was. And then, so I'm gonna click on that and then I'm gonna click on upload video. And it's gonna wanna know where it is. So I'm gonna click on that and this movie here, which I made last night. I've actually already uploaded this video, but I'll show you the process by which you do it. So we're in the YouTube, basically the studio, which is the behind the scenes stuff. This is how you get your stuff up online. So the title is the part that people search for. I've been using for consistency on all of these courses, MASH BPD with a colon, only because if you did a search for them, they'd all come up at once probably with all the police department stuff, um, and then whatever the title is. Then down here is your description about whatever it is, um, your description. You can decide how long that is. You can put links in there if you want to. You have 5,000 characters. So you can decide what it is that you want in your description. Now you have a choice. You can upload a thumbnail. A thumbnail is a small picture that's what you see on YouTube when you're looking through all those videos. Some of the video screens look pretty snazzy. That would be a thumbnail that you've created on your own. Maybe you took my Google Slides for design class and you've learned how to make some kind of artwork and you could make a picture for your YouTube videos. Otherwise, what YouTube will do is it will scan through your whole video and then give you three choices that you can pick from. They'll auto generate it. So if it's a video of you and your face, it might be a horrible picture of your face or it might be of a screen or it could be anything that's located in your video. So for these, I've been doing a um, special like thumbnail for all of them and 
not positive. That's not it. I don't know where I've put them. Oh, here's one. So this is wrong. This is power school with Sean, but I'm going to use it anyway. So now what it will do is it will put that in this upload thumbnail thing. So now I know that my video is always going to look cute on the front, no matter what they pull up for suggestions. I'm going to go down. So this is where you can choose your playlist that we just talked about. So I have that new awesome playlist. Let's put it there, even though really it should go in MASH PPD because of the topic, but I already did that last night. So I'm putting in my new awesome playlist. I could also create a new playlist here if I needed to. And now I'm going to click done. I'm going to scroll down and this is the big question if it's made for kids or no, it's not made for kids. So if these are tutorials that you're going to be sharing with your students, then yeah, you click on yes, it's made for kids. It means that it will treat your um, it will treat your video a little bit more differently to comply with all of the children's online safety and their privacy stuff. It's not a bad thing. It's just that you need to be upfront if it's for kids or contains kids. Mine is not, so I'm going to click no, it's not made for kids. I think if you click yes, it just tells you that personalized ads and notifications won't be available. Um, videos that are not made for kids are more likely to be recommended along other kids' videos. So that's just, and there's a learn more if you want to go back and have some fun and read that. But mine's not made for kids. There's no age restriction on this, like if it should be for viewers over 18. And so I'm not restricting this. And then always go down to more options. You don't have to pay attention to all of this. You can add tags like hashtag math, hashtag MASHP. I don't use the tags, so I don't, this is one place that I don't worry about them. You can make sure that your um, language is on correctly and also that your closed captioning, you just have to answer what type of content you've put up and whether or not it's been aired before. And then I've been putting in, I've been very consistent with this, putting in the recording date, which was yesterday, and the video location. Oops. Which I was at home when I did it. There we go. And I leave the license alone. I do allow embedding. I do allow all of this. You could decide that you don't want to. Embedding means that other people can embed it on their site. I leave my category as education, but I always double check it because sometimes it's different. And then you can decide if you want to allow comments on your videos or not. You can either allow them or you can hold potentially inappropriate ones, or you could hold all the comments until you review and approve them, or you could disable them all together. You decide what you want and then you can sort the comments by newest or um, I think top means most popular. And then you can decide if you want to show the thumbs up, thumbs down or not in your video. Lots of choices. So it's still uploading and it's already given me the link. Like that's one of the first things you get. So usually I'll hit copy just so now I have it on my clipboard, but I'm going to hit next. This is more the video elements for the most part is for people who create videos, you know, for, for a living or for money or for that type of thing, like professionally. So if you get really good, you might want to visit this a little bit more closely. I have not. Next page is the last page. This is when you're deciding if it's going to be private. Only if a private video is literally just like when you share a document like on Google with only like two people, um, then only the three of you can see it. So in private, you can add people. I just, I don't know what the number of people, what the limit is. 99% of the time I choose unlisted because then anyone I give the link to can see it. If they want to share it, those people can see it too. But if someone's on Google typing in in the search bar looking for me or looking for my video, they won't be able to find it. That's what it means by unlisted, just like an unlisted phone number. Anybody can call you if they get your number, but you decide who you're giving your number to. It's not in the phone book. And then public is basically like the phone book. You can look it up and you can visit this site or visit this page. So I usually do unlisted. I don't know what instant premiere is. Must have something to do with like the wow factor. You can decide that you're going to schedule it to come out. Like if you finished it tonight, but you don't want it to show up until tomorrow morning, 
then you can schedule it so that you can have it show up then. And then they just want you to remember about your, is it for kids and double check your content, is it okay? And then again, if I needed to copy the link here, I could, and then I hit save. They give you a plethora of ways to be able to share your video while you have the chance, but if you don't want to, you can do it later and hit close. And now what it does is it adds it to my library of uploads. So now we're still behind the scenes here. And you can see this is the one that I just did, although I did it last night as well. When you float your mouse on it, you get a lot of options. You can go back and change all those details we just did. You can look at your analytics to see who's watching it. You can go in and look at your comments. You can actually watch the video. You can click your little snowman here to fix the title or the description to get a link. Promoting is more of a money thing. You can download your video back into your device or you can delete it forever. You can change if you want it listed, unlisted, public, whatever you want. Um, there are no restrictions on these. If it was just for kids, I believe that would show up there. You could sort them by date. It shows you the number of views and the number of comments and the number of likes and dislikes. So I can go through and see the videos that I've put up over the last week or so and see how they're doing and how many people have watched them. So that's kind of a neat way to be able to see which ones are popular. The Bitmoji one has gotten a lot of hits because I put it up as public. So questions about putting your video up to the YouTube. All right, I'm gonna do one more thing with you and that's basically your channel. So I'm gonna go back out to the regular YouTube. Oops, I'm gonna do it this way, youtube.com. And now I'm on the regular YouTube. And then I am looking for my channel. And forgive me because browse channels is not what I want. Tech Everlasting is my own thing. Give me a second. Is it here? I lied. Is it here? My channel. There it is. Last place that you always look, isn't it? So I clicked on my face and I'm going to go to my channel here. So now my channel, if I'm someone who puts out a lot of content, then you might want to visit my channel or somebody's channel to see what they've got. And it's kind of a place that houses all of it. You can customize the banner at the top. That was my mom's school bus. She was a school bus driver for almost 30 years. But I'm probably due to change that, especially now that I've learned more about creating the artwork for the top of your channel. I believe if I was as good as I think I was last night, I hope that I put in, yes, I put in a template that allows you to make your own Google, um, what do you call that? The, the channel top, this artwork. So if you don't want just a picture up there, you can then create it on that slide that I gave you and you can customize it and then you can upload it. So that's kind of a neat feature. It gives you all the right dimensions that you need. So then down here, what it will show is any of my playlists that I have made public, like I can go to playlists and it should have my Mashpee PD ones, my kid president one, whatever it is that I've created for playlists will show up here. They have to be public playlists in order for everybody to see them. If you are putting up playlists that are private or unlisted, they won't show up on your channel. So you just have to decide what you want to see to see on your channel. Your channel is kind of like your, your front page or your landing page, but just for YouTube. So it has all of your YouTube stuff. Videos will literally list all of the videos that I've put up that are public. Um, channels is going to show anything that I'm subscribed to. I don't even know what discussion is. There's nothing in there. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> the about, I believe, is about me if I want to fill it out. 
Yeah, I really haven't filled out much of anything here, but it has your stats and when you joined, that type of thing. So it's basically a landing page for you and all of your stuff. Um, and then you can customize your channel up here. That's where you're able to change the way that it looks. You can do some editing through here. If you want to change stuff around, you want to move things, you want to delete things, you can do that all through editing your channel. You can also view it as a returning subscriber like or a new visitor to see what they see because it would look different to different people. So there's a lot of things to play with in here. And the good thing is, is that if you do nothing with your channel, then it's okay. It'll still look pretty generic, but it builds itself. It does not have to be customized. It should not be high on your priority list unless you're like me and you like everything to be matchy matchy. You'll see that this channel up here has not been approved for MPS. So right now, if you tried to show the kids my entire channel, it would have to be approved before you did that. So you can approve an entire channel if you know that the videos within that channel are all something that's okay for kids to see. Um, even the settings, gosh, it's like an Easter egg hunt in here. All kinds of stuff that you can see if you wanna hide what you've subscribed to, if you wanna keep all your saved playlists private, it's like you decide the level of um, transparency when it comes to YouTube. I'm going to stop again. Let me go to the home page. Actually, let me stop sharing for a minute because I've lost touch with the fact that I'm talking to humans. <laughs> okay. Everybody's still good? All right. Let me see. I think I did most of what I wanted to on my list. Um, and everything that I put on the intro, we did playlists, we did channels, we did uploads. There's a lot more in here. Like clearly the, the menus in YouTube are, they're, they're huge. <laughs> There's so many rabbit holes that you can go down. And so it takes a while. There, I'm still trying to figure out some of the links, like where they put them, like trying to find that channel link today. Sometimes it's a bear for me to remember where they put everything, but it's all in there. That's for sure. Um, you can also follow other people's channels. Let me share again. Share. So if I do So a good friend of mine is Charity Preston. She's the um, creator of the Organized Classroom. So I can go in, I love to watch her stuff. So I can go in, this is actually her profile here where I can subscribe to her. That means that I'll get an update every time she puts up a new video. And if you have the YouTube app on your phone, you'll also get an update there. If you have those turned on, that will let you know when your favorite creators have put out new stuff. If that gets to be too much, I don't subscribe to a lot, but um, when you do, it does keep you updated if they put out new content. So you can scribe, subscribe to it by clicking on subscribe. I could go to her, this is her channel. So she has done her custom banner at the top. And right now we're looking at her uploads. And then she has some playlists that are further down here, like motivating student writers and organizing your art supplies. Um, so you're able to see what other people have as well. And then I could, and I could approve it. Again, it's another one that's not approved. So if I wanted to go into her label creation, now I'm in her playlist. I'm already subscribed to her as a creator. But if I hadn't subscribed, let's say she did a ton of stuff about classroom, but then a ton of stuff about, I don't know, cooking, and I want nothing to do with her cooking stuff, I could just subscribe to her playlists that are the content that I want if she has them organized into playlists. So that's another way that you can kind of curate what it is that you want to have available to you. So that might be 
a way to organize things as well. You can still add her videos to your playlist. Like let's say hey, I'm everyone, in this video. It's Charity Preston from the organizer. I could still go down here and I could still save individual videos to whatever it is that I want to be able to reference later. I'm trying to think if there's anything else mind blowing. We're in the last few minutes because I'll probably transition in a minute. Any last questions for right now? Back, start, share. So I sent out an email asking if anyone has any cool stuff that they want to share that I'm going to try and do the last 10 minutes of each class as a separate recording to share new ideas or um, projects that people have worked on or tools that they use that are helpful. So in that email, there was an invite to sign up on a Google Calendar. I, if it works right, you should see the four appointments per day and when you click on it you put in your information and then that appointment disappears from my calendar so what i'll do every class now is i'll stop at 10 of the hour or maybe 11 of the hour you guys are learning that i'm a slave to the clock i'm constantly watching it and i want to make sure i stay on time but what i'll do is i'll give that person co-hosting rights and they can share live or if they shared a video with me, then I will share that video and they don't have to do anything. Or if they want to send me the links and the information and enough information that I can share it and give them credit, then that would work as well. So I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, but it's a chance for you to share the amazing things that you're doing out there and I'm already seeing it. And so don't be shy about that. So I already have my first my first one today, which I'm so excited about. I don't even know what you're sharing, but Will, I'm gonna make you a, uh, I'm gonna make you a co-host. And this, we're starting a little bit early because I know that we probably have some bumps that I'm not expecting. So, where is, Will, are you in here? <laughs> Did I lose him? He was in here earlier. I see his name in the chat. All right, he's not in here. I'll wait another couple minutes if you guys have questions in the meantime. And if not, I have a backup one that I can share. Did anyone learn anything new? I feel like I talked for a long time with very few questions. That's either really good or really bad. <laughs> no, Susie, it was really helpful just to give that overview because, like you said, there's so many different menus and rabbit holes on YouTube. So there is. It was just a good, good refresher for me. It was a refresher, but it was good. All right. Good, good, good. Oh, thank you, thank you, Liz. Okay, so let me. Let me reboot, so not reboot, um, refocus. Will's not in here, so I'll have to check up with him and see if he wants a different time. And that means that I'm going to share. I don't even know if he's in here. Let's see. Ben, you are in here. Ben, are you okay if I share your video that you created? Yeah, sure thing. You're awesome, thank you. All right. so. Ben came up with an awesome way to be able to use Zoom to annotate, um, not just inside the Zoom whiteboard, which is okay, but not great, but to be able to annotate on web pages. So I'm gonna hit play on that. He sent it to me last night. So let me hit share screen and back here. And then, so I know it was on the YouTube and I believe I put it in my MASH PPD. Did I? There it is. I did do that. With Zoom that we served this past week, um, some settings to turn on that are not necessarily on by default um, can make your life a lot easier. Um, this past week in the math department, we were trying to figure out 
um, some ways that we could annotate our slideshows um, that would be observable for our students in Zoom. Um, we're running the problem of, you know, when, when we normally present that's me. Present a slideshow on uh, our smart board, right? We would draw it on, on the smart board. Um, you know, if we use the smart board tools, um, that would be great and all. Um, but those would not display on Zoom on the share screen. Um, so we, we kind of came up with a variety of workarounds. Um, PowerPoint has like a built in annotation tool. Um, there are a couple of other things, um, but nothing that really kind of was a catch all. Um, and it really met, met all the needs that we wanted um, and was frankly easy. Um, but we discovered uh, right in the Zoom settings, there's uh, some stuff that we can use that kind of will suit uh, the needs of any program that you might wanting to, uh, that you might be wanting to annotate. Um, so in the Zoom web app, um, I'm just gonna sign in on their website and I come to this page. Off to the left here, I have settings, um, which will pull up this uh, big long list of settings. Um, I would recommend um, going through this at some point, just to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes, kind of like read read each one, read the little descriptions, uh, make sure it's set to how you actually want it, um, because there's a lot of things in here uh, that I found are off by default, um, that are actually really useful tools. Um, that said, a lot of the stuff in here is stuff that we don't really need to worry about. It's networking things and things that um, really we are, are kind of out of the realm of what we need to be uh, worrying about as far as meeting the needs of our students. Um, so I would just give this a flip through, make sure it suits your needs for however you're kind of wanting to operate your Zoom. Um, but yeah. The one that I'm gonna show you, if you click on over to the left here in Meeting Basic, it will scroll you right down pretty much where you wanna be. You'll have to go a little bit further, um, depending on how much is showing up on your screen. And right here, there's this annotation, uh, allow host participants to annotate um, and add information to shared screens by default. Uh, at least for me, this was turned off. Why, I have no idea. It's such a useful tool, um, but I, would recommend that everybody has this turned on. Um, to go with that, um, I would recommend having this checked, uh, allow saving of shared screens with annotations. Um, and the second option, only the user who is sharing can annotate, um, is a little bit different. Um, you can decide if you want this turned on or off. Um, this makes it so that, well, it's pretty self-explanatory, only the user who is sharing can annotate. Um, however, um, there are a couple of things in Zoom settings that we can play with that kind of give us uh, a similar function to this um, and um, in general uh, are kind of more practical than just having this turned on all the time. Um, if you have this turned on, um, then you'll run into scenarios where um, you can kind of never have your students uh, draw on your zoom um, on your share screen. So if I'm presenting a slideshow, um, there are definitely scenarios where I might want my students to uh, you know, write, on, write on the screen or uh, type on the screen um, in a similar way to you know how we in the past have uh, had students come up to the board to show their work for a question in a math class rate right, and kind of have that collaborative work across students. Um, so I'll get more into that uh, and show you a couple of the settings that might work better for this. If you want to have this turned on, I'm sure like that's that's fine. Um, but there are definitely a, a couple other options when it comes to who can and can't annotate on your screen. Um, so the big important part here, turn this on, um, and I would say have this checked. Uh, this is optional. Um, now how this actually works and what's useful for. Um, let's say I'm presenting this right and you know I have my my slideshow uh, here we go right um, I'm actually going to close out it for just a second to load up a zoom meeting um, so I, I zoom here let's make a new meeting hey there I am hello uh, yeah sure join with computer audio great um, so I have my zoom open um, what I'm going to do is actually tab back to my slideshow um, to present it I want it to be full screen um, 
you know, I want to be drawing on this, not on the Google Slides site. Um, once this is full screen, uh, the way to get back to Zoom, if you press the keys Alt and Tab on the screen, you'll get this little menu that's all of the windows that you have open on your computer, right? So I can Alt Tab, if I just press it once, it's gonna take me right back to whatever my last window was. So here it's just flipping between um, the slideshow, the Google Slides, slideshow Google Slides, right? It always go back to whatever the, the last thing you had open was. If I hold Alt and press Tab, I can keep pressing Tab, I can just cycle through these. You can even actually select which one you want with your mouse. So I'm gonna go to the Zoom, right? Um, then uh, my slideshow is still full screened in the background of my you know, computer. It's behind the Zoom window, right? Actually, if I move this, boom, there it is. Um, so it's still full screened. I'm gonna share screen now. I'm gonna select that full screen slideshow and boom, here we are. So normally, again, if it was on SmartBoard using the SmartBoard tools, it's great for everybody in the room, but kids on Zoom aren't gonna see whatever I'm drawing here, right? Like two plus two equals four with SmartBoard doesn't show up in Zoom. However, up here, what we just turned on is this annotate tool, it gives us this little toolbar. You can actually move it, get it out of the way of the information on our slide. Uh, and this has a whole bunch of things. Most of it is pretty self-explanatory. I'll just go over a couple of things and play around with it as much as you want, kind of figure out what tools are most useful for you. Um, but the big one, there's this drawing tool, right? I can use this to poorly underline things. Um, you know, now I can two plus two equals four and, and all the kids on Zoom uh, can see that in the meeting on the share screen. Um, and uh, part of I'm using my mouse to draw these, so uh, not gonna be the most accurate. Um, a little bit of a messy handwriting with the mouse, but uh, we'll get the point across. So we have uh, all different colors. Uh, the big thing, like I said, is this draw tool. It's just the pen here. Um, however, right below it, this this is a highlighter. Um, so I can highlight information, right? Uh, like you know, perpendicular might be a key part of this definition. Um, the shape tools here are um, mostly pretty self-explanatory. This is just a line tool. Uh, this makes a box, um, a circle. The ones below them are a little bit different though. The dotted in ones, the gradient ones, these are basically giant highlighters uh, or shape highlighters. So if I have that selected, uh, I can highlight a whole section uh, quick and easily. Um, same with the circle. And then these are just filled in uh, blocks. So if I want to block off a piece of text, I could do something like this. Uh, I could even make them like fill in the blanks and these can actually be moved. In fact, everything can be moved. Um, stretched and uh, kind of played with using the select tool. You can also add text. Um, so I could even block that out and then add like white text over it. This is hello. Um, and that's that's not what was there, but uh, you get the idea of how you can kind of combine a lot of these tools um, to kind of suit your needs. Stamps, so there's a couple little shapes that you can just click uh, to, to get quick little things on there. Um, Spotlight. So this is kind of like the uh, the pointer tool that's in uh, Google Slides. Um, and yeah, um, I would just recommend get this working. You can hop into a Zoom meeting with yourself, just share the screen and kind of play around with the tools, right? Um, now, uh, the other thing to go over, um, actually close that for a second. Um, I want to kind of jump back to uh, this setting right here, uh, only the user who's sharing can annotate. Um, reason to turn that off, um, or by default, what having this turned off allows is anybody in the Zoom meeting um, can annotate, can use that annotations tool on whatever screen is being shared. So if a screen is being shared, right, I'm sharing my, um, my slideshow, I will get back to doing that. Um, all of my students can use the annotation tool and draw on this, right? And I want to say, in general, <laughs> while you're presenting a lesson, that's probably not what you want, right? You don't want all of your students just doodling all over, uh, you know, the uh, bisector theorems here while you're trying to explain them. Um, however, there are definitely situations where you do want students to be able to uh, draw on the screen, right? Maybe I have, uh, you know, these three problems up um, and I want three different students to kind of work through them, right? And I want to say, you know, okay, put your work 
Um, you know, somebody put their work right here, somebody put their work here. You can put your work on the screen. We can, uh, you know, as a class kind of correct each other's work. Just like, uh, you know, in the way that we kind of have operated in the past, um, students coming up to show their work on the board, right? Um, it can serve a similar function to that. Not quite the same, but similar at least. Um, and I would say even more importantly, if you have students working uh, in breakout rooms, um, the ability for you know one of those students to maybe share screen with an assignment, but have other students kind of contribute and showing their work um, with that instead of just having only that one student being able to write on their screen. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely situations where you kind of want people other than the person sharing their screen to be able to draw. So <laughs> kind of long-winded segue into it. Um, those settings are right here under more. Um, so there's two settings here that are kind of relevant to this. Um, one is uh, show names of annotators. I would have this toggled uh, all the time if you can. Um, so it's, it says hide names of annotators. Um, this will make it so that you can see who's who's drawing or making shapes on your screen. Um, I don't believe it shows you your own name uh, unless I have done something wrong with the setting, um, but it will show anybody that is not you um, who has done the drawings. Um, I haven't tested it, but I believe it might even show um, the students. It would have something, you know, it shows a little thing off to the side here that would say uh, Mr. O, or I guess my name right now is Benjamin Womet has you know, created these annotations. Um, I believe it's it's like a small, pretty out of the way little marking, um, but it could help you if you have those settings on, or you forget to turn something on or off um, and kids start drawing on your screen, you can see who's drawing, right? Um, so it, it's just a generally practical thing to have turned on. Again, one of Zoom's things that's turned off by default but seems useful kind of all the time. Um, and then the more important one is right here, uh, disable participants annotations, uh, which turns into allow participants to annotate. Um, so if you're presenting, right, when you initially pull your Zoom meeting up, uh, I would just go on and hit disable participants, uh, the disable button so that your kids can't be drawing on the screen while you're kind of working through the slides. But then if you get to a point where, you know, I want my kids to kind of work through these problems, right, uh, maybe it's in pairs or whatever, um, I can go in and, and hit, you know, allow participants, participants to annotate and you know now they can all kind of annotate on the same slide and uh, kind of uh, work work on things that way. Um, so um, a little bit long-winded but I hope that uh, that kind of is practical for you all. I'm going to close that out. Um, really just that annotation tool uh, has a lot of uses um, and I would again recommend kind of flipping through the uh, settings here um, and finding if there are any other tools that might be uh, useful for you and how you want to operate your Zoom meetings because there's a lot of things in here um, that are definitely useful. Um, so, yeah, uh, that about covers it. Um, have a great day. And thank you so much for being our first one. It's kind of neat to have you guys learn from someone besides me. <laughs> And Ben, watching it twice now, it's like, I'm glad that I watched it twice because it made me hear things the first time that I didn't. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to hit stop record on what I'm recording now so that we can get ready for our next